Uh, hello uh, from beautiful South Texas. It's currently 107 degrees and I'm crouching in the shade of a Vicellia rigidula, a black brush acacia, even though it's technically not an acacia anymore. Uh, I'm worried about the camera overheating. It's so hot and uh, I'm just dripping sweat. But I'm here to show you uh, a disjunct population of, of a common plant. But this is the long lost population from a region where it does not normally grow and it does indeed look phenotypically quite different, okay? The plant I'm here to show you is this guy right here, the Condylaria, okay? Euphorbia antisyphilitica, looking like little green straws poking up from the uh, calcareous floor, the calcareous sandy floor of the uh, matoral of the thorn scrub. Now, you know, anytime you get a disjunction like this, you gotta, you gotta wonder why and how the hell did it get here uh, one theory for this is that it was uh, possibly brought here by indigenous Americans however long ago, you know, thousands of years, whatever. It does produce prodigious amounts of wax on its stem. We'll get some right here. You can see there's a bunch coming up beneath the black brush. It does produce prodigious amounts of wax on its stems, and uh, it was used for soap making at one point. The species epithet is anti-syphilitica, though I don't think it actually has any benefits for syphilis. But I invite you to try. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. But, uh, but you know, how did it get out here? That's what we want to know. And it, it will root pretty readily. This entire property is due to, you can see it's leaking the milky latex. All right, like many of the euphorbia species do in the genus euphorbia. Uh, we got our old friend Tasahio. Mean as all hell out there. Don't want to brush up against that guy. But uh, anytime you get these disjunctions, you, you get, again, you got to wonder how the hell did it get out here, all right? It was used for soap making. It was used for the wax. You know, up until 80 years ago, shit, they still use it for wax in parts of Mexico. But uh, but it does. It looks, it looks very green compared to the West Texas and Coahuila populations, which have much more of the wax and much more farina. They got that thick kind of whitish cuticle on them, makes them look blue. But these populations, you could see them growing. They're only growing in the shade, like a lot of things do. They don't want to be out in the open. This is just a lot more, uh, a lot more green. Could, is it just environment? Is it just phenotypic plasticity, or is it because of, uh, is it because of uh, this population's had enough time to diverge genetically and morphologically, uh, in turn with this much more humid climate than West Texas? They get more rainfall here than West Texas. It is hot as balls though. Look at this, all of this is about to be cleared for solar panels. You can see over there. It seems pretty fucking short-sighted to me. Look at these, you get these gravel beds. Brought here, you know, a million years ago by the fucking river. Vicellia rigidula, cornerstone of the ecosystem, Senegalia uh, berlandieri. See with those feathery leaves? See that? How do these fucking legumes do it, you know? How do they do it? And with us today, our guide who helped us get out here, my friend Benny, a gentleman and a scholar. He's going to take some. He's going to move it to, to preserve it, basically save it. And I wonder, too, I mean, I, I bet it would but be the case. But if you looked at the, you know, if you looked at this genetically analyzed the DNA, you'd find it was quite far removed. There'd been enough divergence, molecularly speaking, between this and the populations from much drier areas of where it grows like the populations in west texas and coahuila etc okay hold on hold on this plant really confounded the hell out of me its occurrence here is very odd and the habitat that it grows in and the way in which it grows is very odd as well so i had to consult my resident euphorbia expert nathan taylor and he filled me in on what's going on with this species turns out there's two morphologically distinct populations of euphorbia antisyphilitica one to the south of where i am now in mexico with erect cyathial bracts, those little white looking petal looking things that you see here, and the population to the west with spreading cyathial bracts. Now this morphological distinction can actually be mapped and that's what Nathan did right here. You can see the red dots are the erect cyathial bracts and the blue dots are the flowers, the plants that have flowers with spreading cyathial bracts. Now this doesn't tell us how this population got here, but it is quite likely it was a human assisted dispersal. And as the flowers on this population do have erect cyathial bracts, it does tell us that this population came from further south rather than from west Texas. So it basically was transported here by Native Americans who brought it across the Rio Grande, put the plants in the ground here, 
to use as stock plants for food or for the wax or for soap or whatever they were doing with it. It's pretty goddamn interesting, and I love thinking about dispersal events like this and weird disjunctions. Anyway, go fuck yourself. Back to the video. So there you go. Can Candelaria, Euphorbia anti-syphilitica. You can see it's just growing in the shade like everything grows here, growing in the shade of the taller legumes. And uh, the Sideroxylon celestrinum. Good fruits that produces too, which is remarkable. There's a lot of toxic stuff out here, but the Sideroxylon makes good fruits. Nice cicadas to Serenaeus. There's some nice fruits in this uh, Guayacan too. Guayacum angustifolium, Zygophilaceae. The creosote family. Look at that. You see why they call it the honey mesquite. You see, it's got that resin bubbling up. Anyway, you can see this Euphorbia, the Candelaria, it just spreads by clones underground. Spreads clonally by the rhizomes, sending up new shoots. And so that's why it transplants pretty easily. So hopefully we're, you know, we'll be saving a bunch of it, you know, because they are going to just demolish the shit out of this property. All this stuff. It's, it's some of the most pristine thorn scrub I've ever seen in my life here. I mean, look how thick it is. This is what a lot of South Texas looked like back in the day, you know, before you started demolishing stuff for the Panda Express. Why do I always single out Panda <laughs> Express? Huh? Just because it gave me diarrhea that one time five years ago? You know, am I being unfair to Panda Express? Are they going to sue me for libel? Maybe they'll hit me up for a sponsorship at some point. Look at the distal ends of those uh, photosynthetic stems. See how they they get the, that kind of red pigmentation protecting the plant. Remember that red pigmentation acts like melanin. It's anthocyanins protecting the plant, the new growth of the plant, that new tissue from the harsh sun. And that, that sun is indeed harsh. I can't imagine being stuck out here having to walk for 20 miles. I'd fucking die. I mean, it's uh, January. It's hot. You know, it was 80 degrees on Christmas last year. What's it like here in July? This is what it's like. Thank God. You know, Jack and, Jack's in a car, you know. Eating some beef jerky, we got him chilling in the AC. I'm out here filming, you know. Benny's digging some up, but uh, you know, uh, it's just just really, really insane heat, and the humidity makes it that much harder. As you go west a little bit, it starts to dry out, and that's where you start seeing more of this plant uh, growing naturally. But again, those populations, like in West Texas, Presidio County, this stuff is blue. It's 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 almost white. And you could see here, it's just a deep, beautiful, verdant green. Jack, I figured I'd put you in here just, you know, just to give credit where credit's due. You did come along for the ride, all right? You look at me like I'm an asshole if I ask you to get out and walk around with us. I know you hate those spines, but uh, anyway, we'll give you more turkey jerky when we get home, okay? Anyway, so how do we know this plant was growing out here? Well... This is private land, it's very remote, it's out in the middle of goddamn nowhere, and the fact that the thorn scrub is so pristine is a good indication of that. And you can see, look at the damage the pigs have done. See, this is all feral hog damage, you can tell. There's a beautiful acacia rigidula, now vicellia rigidula in fruit. A very important tree ecologically, it's such a beast that can weather this heat and the soil and uh, thrive here. Very important when it flowers earlier in the season, in the spring. So there was a guy who made an herbarium collectionist in the 70s and he sessioned the herbarium voucher, you know, just a pressed plant on a, you know, 11 by 18 sheet of paper and uh, put it uh, put it in the uh, herbarium at Pan American University. Now it's UTRGV, but it was then called Pan American over there in Edinburgh. And so we had one herbarium voucher at his plant. Maybe there's one at UT Austin too, but either way, even then it was notable because it's so odd it's so far out of range, and it does look phenotypically very different. But again, that could just be uh, to the fact that it's a little bit more humid here and they get a little bit more rain. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a really odd disjunction. Anytime you get a disjunction, very interesting. And this, the habit is different. The habitat is different. The fact that it's not growing out in the open. The fact that it grows all leggy and wispy like that. Look at it. You can see some of them die. This plant doesn't normally like shade. When you see it in Coahuila, or in Nuevo Leon or West Texas, it gets about, I don't know, maybe yay tall at the most. It's blue. The, the stems are super clustered together, almost looking like someone stuck an up, you know, upturned broom in the ground. And, uh, you know, it's thriving in full sun. That would be too much for it here. The habitat's different. It's just too hot. You know, we're at a lower elevation here too. So it grows in the shade 
of all the other plants, like most of the cactus does, like peyote does, like star cactus does, like all those cool echinocerias do, all right, like ancestral cactus does, like thelocactus does, okay, so it's a much different habit here, and as a result, it gets, you know, more leggy, it doesn't clump as much, very interesting, how'd it get here, all right, a result of a formerly more widespread ranger was it brought by indigenous people, you know, is it ethnobotanically uh, interesting. Is that the reason why it was here? Because of its ethnobotanical uses. All right, mean fucking I'll punch you. This plant right here is Senegalia berlandii, right? A paper came out 20 years ago uh, saying that they detected via liquid gas chromatography mescaline in the seeds and uh, branches and foliage. Uh, I think the paper later came out, turned out to be bullshit, but either way, very beautiful plant anyway, especially when it flowers and important for the pollinators. Look at that, look, multiple stems, very leggy. Another wonderful member of the legume family, Fabaceae. They got those nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the roots. That's why all the legumes thrive in these really harsh conditions, all right? Whether it's Vichelia rigidula, Texas ebony, Ebonopsis, or the Senegalia belandia, right? Look at that beautiful white, white stems on it, too. You get a kind of, a really cool cactus called the Kinoceres poselgeri that grows, uh, you often find growing up in the middle of these plants along with the mesquite and the stems on that echinoceres don't hurt when you brush into them they kind of just help it camouflage you know they help it blend in with the white stems of the senegalia and some of the other legumes beautiful i love these goddamn i love the senegalias forget what the common name is here for but look at this see that so it grows up it only survives you know when it's got something to grow under for shade but then it also doesn't really like shade too much so then it just ends up dying back and getting all wispy and what the shit. Make up your mind. What do you want? You know? Oh, that plant in the back. This is a really toxic one. Karwinski. I think they changed the genus name. It's in the buckthorn family. You could tell by that venation on the leaves. Super toxic. Eat a couple of those little uh, purple berries when they come out. You might die. Look at that. See, this is growing fully exposed now because all the pigs ripped up. The pigs come for the prickly pears. Rip all the shit up. This is growing fully exposed now. And it kind of looks like, well, it, does, it looks healthy. It looks kind of more how it grows in, in West Texas. More clustered together, doesn't get too tall. But you could see there was once shade, uh, but probably before the pigs took the prickly pear down. But see, it gets all wispy. It dies back. God, it's so odd to see it growing like this. And it's so odd to see it in this kind of habitat. Again, where it grows, just, you know, open desert. None of the thorn scrub. Yeah, just coming up. Growing intertwined probably with the roots of this. Vichelia rigidula. Ha! God, that's weird. How fucking cool. How'd you get here, huh? How'd you get here? Zyphus obtusifolius, a stem photosynthetic buckthorn. I love this plant too, even though it stabs me from time to time, you know? I guess you could say that about some friends too. Just kidding. That's true, you're in an abusive relationship. Get out. So we're digging this up, because this whole property is going to be demolished for a solar farm. But you can see how it spreads by rhizome. I don't know if you could see that in there, but you could see that thick, see it's got that thick lateral root, that thick rhizome. So I often, I wonder, just wondering if these are all the same individual, just spreading by clone, just one massive population, or if there's a couple genetic individuals, probably a few genetic individuals. But uh, if it was all one clone, that would speak more to the fact that it was probably brought here by people, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Man, the fucking pigs, look at that. Just digging up. See, I don't dig. I'm not that messy when I dig. I guess maybe if I was digging with my snout, maybe I would be. But, uh, God, they're really bad. The feral hogs here are really bad. Put them down. Anyway, there's, you can see it's got a new a new side sprout coming out. See that? Not even any chlorophyll yet because it hasn't been above the surface of the ground. But the uh, surface of this sandy, sandy soil, weathered from sandstone, it's about, I don't know, what is it, Cretaceous? It's quite old. Eocene sandstone, maybe? Find tons of petrified wood in here. Oh, there's a breeze. That's nice. First time today. You can see that lateral root. Again, just probably just a massive clone. God, I can't get over how weird it is to see this plant growing like this. Okay? I feel like those exhaust fumes are getting to me. Imagine that. Traveling along the river 2,000 years ago, carrying some uh, candelaria in your satchel. You know, your your family gets to a new spot, you know, right along the way. It was probably the Pleistocene, 
it was nicer to be here. I mean, it's still nice, but you know, I do feel like I'm kind of gonna die right now. I'm dripping sweat. And so you just uh, you just plant the new little farm of Candelaria, because you you know you could use uh, the oils and the waxes and what the shit. I do wonder exactly what they use this for. That long ago, you know, two thousand years ago. Maybe the people that put all those paintings over there in Seminole Canyon, they were eating peyote. They were taking a wax from the Candelaria. Right, they were hunting the deers and whatnot. Life was probably idyllic back then. All right, I, of course, I'm totally talking on my ass. It probably sucked them anyways, too. People live to be like 25. <laughs> 30 years old made you an old man. For 15, 20,000 years, people lived there in a thorn scrub. At one with the thorn scrub, not trying to turn it into fucking Panda Express and Jiffy Lou. Okay, so Benny, tell us what we're doing. Saving Candelaria from, from, from bulldozing for... From certain death see if I can dig and film there's a lot here and there's not much Tassa heel yeah. which is nice because we don't like the Tassa heel we don't like that we don't like Tassa heel you find the spines embedded in your skin you know three weeks later when they, they come shooting out with a little bit of pus uh, <laughs> see, so you gotta yeah you gotta get that make sure we get the root and then and then I just pull it out like that you know, otherwise, because if you just tug on it, you might rip that taproot. And that taproot is where the juice is. They get the carbs stored up so they can send out another root. So, God, it does look so different from West Texas. Such a different habit that here. Give me this a hold of this. The Candelaria rescue operation. Now, Benny, why do you want to save the Candelaria? Because it's very rare out here in Texas. This is the only place I've seen it. That, that grows like I never seen it until until I've been in this property and I was told about it and, and I, you grew up out here you grew, grew up, up out here you've seen all the stuff you know all, all the, the plants the, the, you know where to find the deers find everything out here but except this I'd never seen it anywhere when was the first time you saw this oh, when I when when the property owner told me they were gonna move it and she was worried that he had a little bit of candelaria there was so when you when you messaged me about it yeah when i yeah. told you about it yeah. remember i told you they were gonna uh it's a eight thousand acre uh solar panel commercial solar panel they're gonna they're gonna destroy the whole two thousand acres out here and uh there's a lot of plants out here that need to be saved all right, I'm gonna go throw these in the truck. Yeah, I think these might be all the same clone, just spreading here via rhizome for the last 10,000 years. Who knows? Ah, shit. Toss a heel. God damn. Look at that big. Look at that. Look at that lateral root. So we can't save it all, but we could save some of it. And that's all that counts. All right, you got two buckets. You know, I think the reason it grows in the shade out here too, it could be because of the humidity, which then influences the nighttime temperatures. So it doesn't cool off at night as much here as it does in more desert environments. Because this isn't really desert. This is just subtropical, seasonally dry thorn scrub. So look, you get some pieces of petrified wood from uh, maybe from the Eocene, maybe from the Cretaceous. I think most of the sediments out here are Eocene though. So. Anyway, sorry we can't save you, but we got, we got your genes. We got some of your clones, okay? You're gonna be fine. Look at all the goddamn echinoceries. Look at that, just like little ropes, little green ropes growing in the shade of the mesquite. Goddamn. See how it just grows prostrate on the ground like that. Echinoceries pentalophus. And everything's growing in the shade. See that? The hematocactus, the mammillarias, the corophantum acromeris. It's just just too hot out in the open. And I guess it would probably get stamped on by a uh, javelina too. You see all the lichen on the ground? See that? Huh? All just starts all just starts photosynthesizing. Turns green, start well not green, but it, it lightens up. It's not a it's not so crusty, you know, when it's a little bit cool, well, a lot cooler. And uh, the ground this way, you get some moisture. So that crust holds the soil together. Look, you got a nice little mammillaria hydrite right there too. Just sinking into the ground, kind of yellowing though. Looks like it's getting too much sun. Again, it just doesn't cool down enough at night here 
for stuff to be able to grow open exposed at least any of the cacti maybe the prickly pears but the hamato cactus set of spines with those recurved spines look at they look a little ma'am just hiding out look we're using those spines as partial shade screen see that mammillaria sphericus see what the see with the golden the golden tinge to it little little yellow tubercle bastard one of many cacti you see in a thorn scrub and then we see oh there's you know you always well not always sometimes sometimes it doesn't happen but generally when you're walking around out here in a brush you end up coming across some peyotes some lophophorus all right these are these are uh they gotta be this one's got a couple heads so it's all the same plant beautiful color to it very robust very healthy looking despite it being 107 degrees but you know i've seen mounds in other other areas of stark county where it's just you know two feet wide nearly a foot tall but uh you do you got quite a few there's a little guy right there oh great i just touched that a punch i got the glockets in my hand little guy right there one right there but uh there wasn't a whole lot of it though we were you know walking through the brush you know, trying to look for more of the Candelaria, and uh, these are the first individuals we've seen. But always, always nice to see an old friend. How you doing there, guy? And again, just growing beneath, growing in the, the light shade, the light sprinkled shade canopy of the mesquite. Look at that, there we go, nice piece of petrified wood. And this one, these are, uh, these right here seem to be some sort of conifer, but this one, uh, due to the uh, lack of uh, secondary growth, you know, there's no rings and plus the texture It's just palm. This is petrified palm wood. It's crazy to see a piece of petrified wood and, and know You know down to what what the uh, genus am I? Well, I guess not genus, but family, you know, it's uh, Eric Casey you could see that I mean again, no rings you just see the little rays Coming out from the center of the plant. So it's a uh, petrified palm. So we know it's younger then how old are palms? What, 80 million years? How, ba how far back did they go? Maybe late Cretaceous. So we know that this is uh, within the last 70 million years. So probably, uh, certainly tertiary, probably after the comet knocked out the dinosaurs. Nice petrified piece of palm wood. And there is Varilla Texana, a member of the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. You can see the old uh, flower heads right there. They're yellow when they're blooming. And uh, late winter, early spring. It's a succulent member of composite of the composite family. Got those succulent leaves with a woody taproot. Tends to spread clonally, and you often get Astrophytum asterius, a very rare member of uh, the cactus family that grows out here. Rare and declining populations, and this is what the habitat looks like. These gravel beds, very salty soil with the uh, Varilla texana. Varilla texana, there's one other species in the genus. It's in the marigold tribe of Asteraceae, the sunflower family. But pretty wild habitat, but I love these gravel beds deposited who knows how many millions of years ago by an ancient river. As we continued to traipse along on this massive property, we encountered some of the most pristine thorn scrub that I had ever seen in the region. Though there was no more Euphorbia anti-syphilitica, this habitat did contain some things that were very rare and very special. So now coming up on a little hill, you could see we still got those gravel beds. We also have very larger pieces of, uh, very much larger pieces of petrified wood in there. Looks like uh, it, Maybe this is still the palm wood, I can't really tell. But uh, that, see, you can see those pits, that's definitely palm wood. You can see it's just coming up uh, on the hills, just slowly eroding. There's probably much more down there. Oh, it looks like a little, uh, little more taro or something. And of course we got uh, our old friend, uh, Ancestral Cactus, Shirii. What a beautiful little, get those coloration on the spines and the, the fish hooks on the distal end fish hooks on the distal end of those central spines and then quite a few radial spines uh, around uh, the center of that areola as well. Lots of pieces of chert, lots of workings. Many of them, many of these uh, pieces of chert have been chipped 
So the human habitation area has been going on for a very long time. That ancestral cactus, see that one right there? Okay, while, while the plants uh, certainly get priority, we can't uh, ignore the largest stumps of petrified wood that we also see in this uh, tertiary exposure. This is early, again, I think this is Paleocene, maybe, maybe Eocene, but look at this, massive, massive chunks. You know, back when the area was uh, maybe a swamp in the Eocene, what was uh, Star County like 50 million years ago? Jesus Christ, look at that. You got pits in the wood and everything. Just massive chunks here. Another big piece right there. And yet, uh, oh look, you got a giant piece down there too. It's so hot, it's distorting the camera. <laughs> I'm surprised this thing isn't shutting off yet. And of course, there's big chunks right there as well. Oh yeah, look, we got a big old, big old guy right there. Just giant logs. Just entombed in all the uh, all the Eocene gravels and whatnot. Look at that! See them big pieces right there. There's so much just eroding out of the wash. Look, this piece look, it looks fibrous still. Looks like it may have decayed a little bit before it was uh, silicified and uh, permineralized and whatnot. There's just little chunks of wood just everywhere, just all up and down this arroyo. Oh, Benny found the point. The first one ever. There's another. Uh, oh, that's a beautiful little piece. Look at that. Pretty cool. See how I wonder how long it was waiting there. How long it was sitting there. That's what I wonder. And then there's just pieces of I petrified wood. Ah, fuck! I'm getting stabbed. Oh god! Just little pieces poking out of the dam. Look at it. You got. It looks like caliche down there. I found a point here. So you can see where all this, where it all comes out of. You know, it just weathers out. 50 million year old, a 50 million year old lag. See, there's a little peyote looking, looking uh, quite stressed, but hanging in there, it just sunk into the ground. In this open exposed uh, habitat like that, you can see it. Okay, so this, this is pretty interesting because this is a, a new location, at least as far as I'm concerned, for a plant that's even more rare than peyote. This is the enigmatic star cactus, Astrophytum asterius. You can see it's turning yellow, as they tend to do when exposed to full sun. And I got that nice uh, Rio Grande Valley heat, but it's uh, it's called star cactus. Also, I think it kind of looks more like a sand dollar, but populations of this have been declining for years, and no one really knows why. Unlike peyote, these, these are not self-fertile. You need two plants to cross-pollinate, so maybe there's just not enough uh, regeneration going on or or what but uh it's a beautiful plant very common in cultivation the japanese have done some wild shit crossbreeding them getting weird uh cultivars and whatnot but but here in uh, the rio grande valley the populations are are declining and again no one really knows why it should be protected as far as i know it's not medicine doesn't have any songs so you can't really eat it no prayer uh for ceremony None of those, none, it's got probably some alkaloids in it, but none of the psychoactive ones. You said your grandpa was saying that there was no songs for it? There's no songs, there's no prayers for it. Leave it alone, to keep it in the ground. How the shit did you see that? How'd you even see that? God, look at that. Here's the other one. How the shit did you see that? You just see... I'm looking. It's just the, the, the angle of the sun, though. You got magic eyes, god damn. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's the second one I buy and I've been looking for them all the time. You see that? You see, he's got an eye for everything. He's a goddamn wizard of the thorn scrub. Look at that. Holy shit. It's that good stuff. That good El Sao's chert. It's a chert quarry a little ways east of here. I think that's what most of So this is locally sourced. Locally sourced the points. Who knows from how long ago. More loaves, you know. But no matter how many loaves you see, you're never going to see a star cactus. You know. I like for up for you see you see ten you'll see fifteen loaves won't see a single star a single sand dollar cactus a single astrophytum it's really sad what's happening to that plant I don't I don't see it uh, lasting another fifty years in in uh, in situ and habitat it's got much less of a tap root too you know because it's the common in cultivation I've got like three of them you know when you when I wherever I you know pot them up and something new you can see there's no taproot there 
whereas Lafafra has got massive tap roots. I mean, you know, it goes six inches, eight inches down into the, into the soil. First Helietta I've seen all day. It smells really good. Citrus family rutaceae. Helietta parviflora. Or parvifolia. I don't fucking know. I always get those two mixed up. Crush those leaves up. It smells pretty good. And you got a rhabdota snail hanging out in there too. See? They just post up there. Thing's still alive. I don't know how it's surviving the 105 degree heat. Fuck, I don't know how we're doing it, to be honest with you. Well, that's all I got for today. What an underappreciated landscape. Countless jewels exist in the thorn scrub. Have a great evening. Go fuck yourself, bye.